Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar on COVID-19 remote consultations and the future of doctor-patient interaction. With this webinar, we are resuming our series of webinars on COVID-19 responses, which started last year in October. And we have prepared a new installment of uh, webinars rolling out over the coming years. Now, the topic remote um, consultation plays an important role in avoiding infections in waiting rooms and providing access to patients. Remote consultations, either by phone or by video platform, are around for quite some time, but the pandemic seems to be a driver, making it more widely available across Europe. To this end, we want to understand what sort of barriers need to be removed to allow for remote consultations, and what are the implications beyond the pandemic with regards to the doctor-patient interaction. My name is Matthias Wismar. I'm the program manager with the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. I'm today your facilitator and I will guide you through the program and the session. Our keynote speaker is today my colleague, Erica Richardson. It's a great pleasure to announce her today. Usually you, are, you know her from a different role when she was presenting the health system response monitor and when she was um, running the, the, the chat box. But today she will have the keynote and she will give us an overview on remote consultation and COVID-19. She will also give us an overview on what countries have done and how they have implemented remote consultation. This will be followed by three spotlight speakers. First of all, from uh, France, Dalia Aissa, from the Caisse Nationale de Assurance Maladie. Um, and um, she's actually working in the strategy and development uh, department. Second, from uh, Belgium, Patrick Mistian. He works in the Healthcare Knowledge Center and he has extensively researched on um, remote consultation. And finally, from Germany, Dominic Graf von Stilfried. He's director of the Central Institute of um, Physicians in Germany. Now, when we talk about a remote consultation, we want to focus a bit on the constructive bits and pieces. First of all, what can we learn from the implementation to address the issue during the pandemic? But secondly, we also want to learn what should be actually retained. So the opportunity of uh, learning from some of these issues is here and how can we actually strengthen health system resilience. Um, for the house type housekeeping, our time budget is very tight, uh, which is a challenge to all of the speakers. We have to ask them to be really very, very brief. Just three things. Um, please send all your questions and comments through the chat box. My colleague, Dimi, will uh, feed back the chat to us uh, towards the end of the session. We are also going to record this video and we will um, publish it later on on our YouTube uh, channel. And uh, finally, we would like to ask you to fill in the evaluation forms that will be uh, popping up after the um, session. So. Uh, as I said, we are restarting, resuming our webinar series. So next Tuesday is the, the next one. And um, now we would like to introduce a new element. We have prepared a poll. Um, this is a bit of a reaction to uh, some of the comments we received from, from you. We want to engage a little bit uh, more with you. And the poll has the aim to uh, get a little bit more understanding of your experiences with the topic. So Jara and Timmy, can you please start the poll? Yes, thank you, Matthias. Uh, good morning also from my side. Um, and also to thank uh, Jara, who is our unsung hero today, uh, running the technical side of the meeting. As you will see on your screens, we have three questions, which many of you have already started to answer. Uh, they are very clear. Have you had, uh, did you have a remote consultation before the pandemic? Did you have one during the pandemic? And will you will be willing to have one after the pandemic? Yes and no questions. Please take a moment to fill them out. Um, and we will not show you the results yet. So we will keep the results to ourselves until after the keynote, because we don't want to bias any of your uh, answers to the third question. Um, so please use the poll. It's really easy to click on it to let us know uh, if you have experience with remote consultations before and or during the pandemic and how you view them um, after the pandemic. 
Um, I think we'll give it a couple of more seconds. We have a total of almost 90 people who have already clicked. Out of 134, we can do a bit better. Um, so we wait maybe a little bit longer uh, for the rest of you to click through. Um, and then uh, we will close the poll uh, in maybe 10, 15 seconds or so um, and show you the results after Erica's keynote. We're almost at 100 out of 135. There we are. Okay, so a couple more seconds uh, to answer the poll and then we will remove it from the screen so that um, Erica can uh, show you her slides. In any case, we will pick up the results uh, at a later stage uh, and as at the at the very end of the um, discussion. Yeah, Matthias, and let let me just uh, pick up uh, one of the questions or comments that has already come up uh, in the in the chat before we start. So we have a colleague uh, who says, "I'm a lecturer. I don't do consultations, but I'm interested in the session." And this is perhaps an important point that this is not a session that's only for those who might be doing them or might be using them as patients, but also for those who are researching the phenomenon of the change over the pandemic. So everyone is welcome, and hopefully, it's interesting for everybody. Um, Okay, shall we, uh, Jara, shall we wrap up uh, with the poll so that we can go ahead with the uh, session? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, Erica, the floor is all yours. Please uh, give us your keynote. Hello, everywhere, everyone. Uh, really wonderful to be here in a slightly different capacity today, um, just to share some of the work uh, that uh, I've done with colleagues. Um, Dali will be speaking later but also uh, Gemma Williams and Nick Fahi. And we've looked at uh, remote consultations um, uh, in, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and seeing what that would mean for sort of digital technologies moving forwards. So, first of all, I think it's important that we define our terms a bit. So um, a remote consultation is an appointment between a patient and a clinician over the telephone using video uh, rather than face to face. Um, now this is uh, what I'll be talking about today um, the, because it is the most common mode when we talk about remote, remote consultations. But there are also of course asynchronous modes such as the use of SMS or text messaging, um, email consultations and also using platforms such as WhatsApp, um, even sort of uh, Facebook and uh, things like this. Um, they can also be used, different messaging apps, uh, but these are much less common. Remote consultations can be used for diagnostics, they can be used for treatment, and they can be used for triage. Um, um, and they can also, it's also very important to note that although we'll be focusing mainly on doctor patient interactions today, of course, they can be extended to um, other health professionals, such as physiotherapists, psychotherapists, and there's some really interesting uh, data available on the use of remote consultations by other health professions. So why remote consultations? Well, they've long been recognized as a useful tool in um, enabling access to services. Um, but then they've not been universally implemented. Uh, telephone consultations are very well established in many countries, uh, particularly, for example, in the country where I live, which is the United Kingdom, and particularly in primary care. Um, but video com uh, conferencing, video uh, uh, telehealth has been much less widely implemented. Most often the research evidence has focused on the potential for telehealth solutions to meet the needs of underserved populations. So um, particularly as a means of overcoming health workforce shortages in remote and rural areas, um, but also to improve uh, convenience for patients that work, have reduced mobility or even mental health problems, which act as barriers to them accessing face-to-face -face care. Evidence has also shown that remote consultations can be cost effective um, compared to routine care, and particularly when it comes to uh, routine treatment for people with chronic conditions, supporting people with chronic conditions to uh, look after their own health, as well as those living in remote areas, um, while uh, providing a safe, um, 
mode of uh, care, um, an effective mode of care and achieving equivalent patient outcomes and improved patient satisfaction. So how has COVID-19 impacted on the use of remote consultations? Well, uh, I'm sure that uh, many of you will be unsurprised to hear that it's had quite a big impact. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of the details or in terms of numbers because you're going to get very good, uh, interesting country examples coming up with the spot country spotlights, but um, rapidly expanding access to remote consultations by telephone and video link have, has enabled health systems in Europe to better cope with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, remote consultations have served to reduce pressure on inpatient care. They've helped reduce transmission by reducing the number of contacts um, and allowed people with COVID-19 to be supported remotely in their own home. Um, so providing health services effectively with COVID-19 to be um, uh, the remote consultations have also enabled people with other care needs to continue to seek care, um, in particular um, those who are most vulnerable to uh, COVID-19 infection through face-to-face -face contact. Now, remote consultations in primary care were scaled up rapidly in many countries. Um, for example, in Croatia, Malta, Poland, Sweden, um, and they were also used more intensively in others where remote consultations were already a part of the sort of uh, wider tapestry. And uh, so those are countries like the United Kingdom, Denmark, Austria, Estonia. Um, now to ensure the quality of remote consultations, professional guidelines on the safe use um, of remote consultations and on uh, quality e-prescribing, they were rapidly developed in some countries, um, as were training programs uh, for health workers who were uh, new to this uh, way of using technology. However, it's not clear that this shift in uh, modes of access will be sustained after the pandemic. Um, there is some evidence that with the easing of lockdowns, for example, over the summer, um, that pr the preference was actually for face-to-face -face consultations and the use of remote consultations did fall dramatically in some countries, particularly, for example, in Luxembourg. So what were the challenges? Well, even before the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, technological challenges and professional skepticism, and as well as ethical, financial, administrative, and legal barriers had limited the uptake um, and the use of remote consultations in health systems across Europe. Um, so this ensured that they accounted for quite a limited proportion of you know, total patient consultations. Um, this meant that less progress until the pandemic, less progress had been made than either the technology or the regulations actually allowed for. Um, for example, uh, the best example of this is probably with um, video, the use of videos um, that would, uh, and other platforms that would enable the simultaneous sharing of sort of test results, diagnostic images, and other files. They were much less routinely used than telephone. Uh, remote consultations. Now, regulatory and financing changes to support remote consultations uh, came about very quickly, um, uh, as you know, in order to address these key barriers to the wide the wider use of remote consultations. Um, and restrictions had to be relaxed rapidly, um, with the demands of providing care during the COVID nineteen crisis. Um, restrictions on the use of different video platforms in France or volume restrictions in Germany and Sweden um, were rapidly resolved and uh, also there was an, the introduction and expansion of e-prescribing uh, e and remote sickness certification in countries uh, like Estonia. So looking to the future, what are we going to need? Well, uh, one of the most important things is the technology. There is still a technological need to ensure stable and secure platforms that are designed to protect patient confidentiality are in place. Um, 
and it's imperative that uh, health professionals actually have access to those platforms um, because not all commercial platforms are really fit for such potentially sensitive communications. Um, in order to get the most out of this technology, there is also a clear need for training and support for health professionals in how to use the technology to um, effectively uh, um, get, get, use it to its full potential, but also to effectively build relationships remotely with um, their patients. Um, and there's also a clear need to address equity concerns. Um, so if we emphasize too much um, di digital solutions such as video links, um, it has the potential to widen what's known as the digital divide in countries where not all households are online, um, particularly those living in deprived areas um, or potentially people in older age groups. Um, now, social or economic policy solutions are out there which uh, would ensure equitable access to the internet, and this would address these particular equity concerns. But until those socioeconomic policies are in place, um, it's really uh, important that uh, there is equity and access to in-person uh, consultations and access to in-person face-to-face -face consultations are there for those people who cannot access uh, uh, consultations remotely. So if you want more information on this and you want to read the full paper, please do. It's in the special issue of EuroHealth um, and there's a lot of information in there. It's a real bumper issue and I recommend uh, you all download it. It's free to download. Um, and if you're interested in the work of the Health Systems Response Monitor, then please do um, check that out as well. Uh, again, it's all there online, Free, free, uh, free open access for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank Erica, you. thank you so much. I think that was an excellent overview. You've been introducing the terminology and uh, general trends uh, across uh, Europe with regards to the pandemic. And I think that our keynote speakers, you know, they will zoom in on the very concrete situation and the development of the use of um, uh, remote consultation in France, Belgium and Germany. But we, before we move, into the country experiences. Um, I would like to ask uh, Dimi and Jora to present with us the um, results of the poll. And maybe Dimi, you have already first idea what the, the figures actually may mean. <laughs> Please, Dimi. Um, I'm not sure that I have an interpretation yet, or maybe. So we have about, um, uh, I hope uh, Jora, if you can project so that everyone can see it. Uh, we have about 20% uh, of our participants who did who had a remote medical consultation before the pandemic um, and about 55, 56% who had one during the pandemic and 90% um, says they, are, they would be willing to have a remote consultation after the pandemic. So we see a, a difference. Uh, so there's more uh, participants who had a remote consultation during the pandemic uh, as, com as compared to those who had one before. Clearly the poll is very simple. So we cannot really say what type of consultation that was uh, out of the categories that Erica highlighted. The very high willingness of about 90% of having one after the pandemic, I think also shows that we are we have had more exposure to this now. We, are, we know that it works. Um, if I bring that um, in conjunction with some of the things that we see in the chat already. So we had one question from Esther from Hungary, whether we have a prediction about how high uh, the quota will be after the pandemic, so how much of the online consultation we will remain. Uh, and we have other uh, participants who have mentioned that there may also have been a push in some countries uh, to return to face-to-face -to -face consultations, even though the digital uh, consultation or remote consultation worked during the pandemic to a satisfactory degree. So I think uh, so much for the poll in summary. The, also, we see what we saw in, Erica, in Erica's results, that there was an increase of consultations during the pandemic. And it seems that at least in our audience, there is a high willingness to, um, to have um, uh, remote consultations after as well. Thank you so much, Demi. And as you say, I think the first two questions are fully 
in line with Erica's presentation. And Erica also mentioned that remote consultation is already kind of on the back track again, but apparently our participants, they are rather in favor of keeping this option. We'll be very interesting to discuss this uh, over the course of the webinar today and also in light of the questions in the chat box. Now I would like to give the floor to our um, spotlight speakers and we start with Dalia from France. Dalia, please, the floor is all yours. So, hello everyone. Um, so I am Dalia, I work at the Statutory Health Insurance uh, CNAM. So we'll present you today the French uh, experience on remote consultations. So in the first part, I will uh, present you the requirements of teleconsultations in France before and how it was uh, eased during the pandemic. So the consultations in France were implemented in September 2018. So at that time, we had really strict requirements um, in France, such as the priority that, well, the, the, well the, the prior knowledge of the patients uh, for a physician to, to carry out a teleconsultation. Also, only video um, teleconsultations were allowed, which means that no telephone consultations could uh, be done. Um, on March 2020, we of course eased um, the requirements for carrying out teleconsultations. Um, there was this uh, derogation to the principle of the prior knowledge of the patient, um, but also uh, we made uh, possible for a physician to, to do a telephone consultation. Uh, in this second part, I will uh, show you the volume and the characteristics of the physicians and the patients involved um, involved in these uh, teleconsultations in France. So, in the in the first uh, graph um, on the left, you can see um, the number of teleconsultations in France in 2020. So, before the pandemic, um, I'm just sorry. Um, yeah, so uh, before, so the um, teleconsultations were um, really um, low, so the taking off of teleconsultations was really low, but um, during the first lockdown, as you can see, um, from week 12 to week 19, uh, teleconsultations were really increasing, and then after the first lockdown, so um, from the, well, the, the week 19, um, the consultations were decreasing, but definitely remained uh, higher than before the pandemic. Um, the second graph uh, that you see is the evolution of the, of the number of teleconsultations in physici in, by physician in private practices. So um, as you can see, the, the blue line is representing the, the GPs, uh, the number of uh, teleconsultation made by GPs um, and the green, green lights uh, the green one by specialists. Um, basically, um, and what is important is that uh, in France, 80% of the teleconsultations carried out um, were built by GPs. Um, and also uh, an interesting point is that before the crisis, only a few percent of phys physicians were practicing um, those teleconsultations. And then, um, so now is that uh, half of the physicians are practicing uh, those teleconsultations in France. So, um, yeah. Uh, regarding the characteristics of the patients involved, um, well, we were quite surprised because one fifth of the patients were 70 years old and older. Uh, and uh, also, well, um, this was expected, but one fifth was uh, under 30 years old. And finally, what I, I can add uh, about this uh, second, second part is that 80% uh, um, of those teleconsultations were carried out between um, a physician and a patient that knew each other. Um, and yeah, for, um, for just finishing with this last part, we can ask ourselves, so what would be the future of telemedicine in France? Well, uh, definitely teleconsultations. Uh, we are sure that teleconsultation will be um, used in a sustainable way. Um, they will definitely remain higher than before the pandemic where the taking off was really slow. Um, as a statutory health uh, insurance, so CNAM, we are negotiating with physicians to ease uh, permanently those, uh, uh, those teleconsultations. And we might, um, but it's under negotiations, but we might um, delete the prior, um, well, the, re the strict requirement uh, of the prior knowledge of the patient. 
So I guess, yeah, it will help and, uh, and ease more permanently the, the, the teleconsultations in France. Um, also, we know that um, teleconsultations, and I will just finish on this uh, on this point, teleconsultations uh, are not, um, they do not have to replace uh, a face-to-face -face teleconsultations, especially for chronic disease patients, but uh, it's really important that they complement uh, the face-to-face -face ones, and um, we will definitely refocus on that in the couple next month and after the pandemic. So how um, the elderly people and the chronic disease people, uh, chronic disease patients, sorry, are committed to those teleconsultations. And also, um, does it really uh, tackle, I mean, help uh, in medical deserts in France for patients to, yeah, to, to, be, um, to be monitored by a physician? Thank you very much for your attention. Dalia, <clears throat> thank you so much. That was really super interesting. And thank you so much for being so so brief. I think you could have talked about the topic for, for, for ages. Two things I found particularly interesting. Number one, that apparently on all sides, there's a lot of learning on the doctor side, but also on the patient side, using it really. And what uh, I found very encouraging was to hear that the 70s, the, the people 70 years old and older were actually um, using it. Um, Erica was talking about the digital device, and I think that is rather a very positive outcome. And also what I found interesting is that um, the, the larger part of the remote consultation was based on an already existing patient-doctor relationship. I think you mentioned that 80% of remote consultations were conducted with patients that already uh, were in touch with the doctor previously. So thank you so much. We will come back to this um, in the question uh, time. And I see that the chat box is already uh, getting quite full, which is very, very good. And we have enough time to talk. And we come now to the situation in Belgium. Please, Patrick, the um, floor is all yours. So before the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, there was no legislation of female racial whatsoever for remote care. The most professional organizations were against it. There were only some small scale pilots going on and only a few platforms uh, which you could use for video consultation. And then during the first wave, um, legislation and remuneration reimbursement came uh, was installed for synchronous remote care. Initially it was only for MDs and later it was extended to more healthcare professionals. And between the half March and the end of May, the number of remote consultations really exploded from zero up to three million and was performed by almost uh, 20,000 MDs. It was mainly telephone and mainly GPs who were using it. Also, the number of video consultation platforms exploded. There was a governmental task force installed to assist video platforms on security and uh, other requirements. Here you see uh, a graph, and it's from one insurance company only, uh, in which you clearly see the explosion of uh, remote consultation in the beginning. However, you see after the first wave, it also decreased uh, a, a real decrease of the number of video consult of, of remote consultation afterwards. There also has been done a patient survey and a GP survey. And uh, remarkable things from the patient survey that some patients had both video and telephone and patients were more satisfied with video consultations compared to the telephone. And half of the patients would like some technical support when uh, using video consultations. And from the GP survey, uh, almost 90% thought that re remote consultation would remain part of the future practice. However, there were also technical problems that should be solved with video consultations. And they said that digital skills should be enhanced both in physicians and in patients. And if you want to read more, you can hear, I have some more sources in which uh, I use for this presentation. Thank you. Patrick, thank you so much for this um, uh, presentation and the, um, the the analysis on the situation and in Belgium, I think uh, quite similar to, to France with the first wave, you know, the teleconsultation, they, they exploded. But what I found very interesting here is to see that number one, the doctors actually want to retain them, uh, retain it, even though they have been so much against it in the, in the beginning. And maybe during the discussion, we can 
talk about a little bit how this barrier was actually overcome. But I also found it very interesting to see that the, the patient survey um, seemed to suggest that the um, patient were more happy with the uh, remote consultation than with the face-to-face -face, uh, consultation. I think that is something which we need to pick up in the... It was uh, video consultations compared to telephone consultations. Okay, video to telephone. Sorry, then I got it wrong. Okay, thank you so much for this. And um, uh, we'll come back to this in the um, discussion round. So, Dominic, um, please fill us in on the situation in uh, Germany. Present to you uh, the data of the first wave only, unfortunately, so far. Uh, you can see here the development in Germany. Um, we had a peak of the first wave about uh, the end of March. It was then slowing down again, and uh, <clears throat> uh, it was very low. Uh, the, the, the new incidences were very low in uh, June. Uh, and you can see here during the first uh, beginning of the uh, pandemic wave, um, uh, uh, which really had about, about half of that was covered by remote consultations uh, compared to the year before. Uh, after that, in the second quarter, uh, we had an even greater uh, decrease of personal contact, 12 million overall, and uh, that was not uh, significantly covered by remote consultations. Um, the physician practices were open, but patients decided actually not to go and see their physicians. Um, so how was that um, overall situation shared across the different groups of providers? Uh, as you've seen, all ambulatory care went down by about 12 million, the personal contacts. Um, GPs, about 5 million. Pediatricians, about 1 million. Specialists, about 7 million. And psychother psychological uh, psychotherapists, about 0.1 million. Um, and you can see that uh, most of that happened during April and uh, May. And in June, uh, personal contacts were picking up again, in particular here with the like, psychotherapists, who were also pushing hard for uh, telephone and video consultations, which was not usual hitherto. Um, uh, here you can see um, the uh, increase in telephone consultations in the second quarter. And uh, there is a leveling off towards June, but it's probably not as significant as you've seen in uh, France and Belgium. Um, and uh, I think what we also see is that uh, regulation was expanded to allow uh, to bill for extra hours uh, in telephone consultation. And that also was used quite extensively by those who did provide telephone consultations. Um, video consultations um, are not quite as um, popular. Uh, just to go back again, you can see here we had uh, a, total, a total extra of uh, about 1.6 million in the second quarter of uh, telephone consultations. And we had uh, 1.2 million extra compared to uh, the year before. Um, what is significant here is that we had hardly any video consultations in the year before, as you can see here. Um, so that was a, an enormous boost, the pandemic for video consultations in Germany. These are video consultations that need to fulfill uh, technical requirements that are set at the federal level. So it's not uh, WhatsApp or uh, 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 um, any of the sort of standard providers for uh, video calls. It must be a specific um, video platform that limited the use of it, of course, and it leveled off, as you can see. Um, regulation uh, to improve or uh, facilitate um, the uh, remote consultations was uh, uh, twofold. First of all, uh, on the level of the benefit package, uh, physicians were allowed to issue incapacity certificates for sick leave um, up to seven days by phone for mild upper um, respiratory diseases uh, during um, uh, March until uh, May this year. Um, so this is still in place. Um, and um, uh, there were various uh, uh, reimbursement um, allowances made for uh, uh, a greater use of um, remote consultations. 
Um, my impression is, and, and the data is really not um, there yet uh, about the, the second wave, is that um, uh, the first um, uh, uh, wave was different from the second wave because the degree of fear uh, uh, about the virus was much greater. And um, so everybody tried to move towards uh, remote contacts as much as possible. We don't see that as much during the second wave now. And I would say uh, the outlook for remote consultations in the future after the pandemic is undecided. There will be some more uh, uh, remote consultations. We're also doing a study, for example, to uh, digitally supported um, remote patient monitoring for infectious patients, for chronic uh, disease patients, uh, to compare various platforms uh, in their practicability uh, for physicians and patients. Um, um, we also see an expansion of uh, sort of corporate providers uh, using um, employed physicians for uh, remote consultations. And, and that is a development that is seen critically, I think, among most physicians in Germany. Um, and that remains to be seen how that is uh, uh, accepted in the future by the patients. Um, so I would conclude further discussion in light of the experiences is needed. Uh, thank you for your um, attention. Thank you so much, Dominic, for this uh, great overview in Germany. And I think uh, very important, your outlook and um, your, your personal assessment of the situation. And in a way, actually, it coincides, which was uh, Erika's message earlier on. There's quite some uptake during the pandemic, but it's not so sure whether the same level will be maintained or whether there's even some backwards movement, even though, according to our poll, our small sample here, of course, people are rather in favor of keeping the um, option of um, remote consultation. Thank you so much to all our speakers, to the spotlight speaker and Erica, the keynote speaker. You've been all very kind to stick to the um, very tight um, uh, time budget. And this, this gives us the opportunity to really, really work with the um, questions in the chat box. And I think we had today quite quite a number. So uh, Dimi, uh, quite a job today for you to get this all sorted and to put it back to the um, panelists. Dimi, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, maybe just to uh, go back to what you said here at the end and what I said earlier about our uh, sample and 90% of our participants being willing to have remote consultations. There is there are a couple of, of points on that in the chat that you know this is slight, a slightly biased group because by virtue of being here of course you're interested in the area but on the other hand i mean we have also participants uh, who mentioned that from their own country's experience patients may also have felt a little bit fed up and a little bit let down by their physicians and thinking that you know they were using technology and the pandemic as an excuse not to see them face to face um, and this interpretation of the numbers going down again after um, uh, lockdown, it, it needs to factor in quite a number of things. And we have quite a bit of uh, input in the chat rather than questions. Um, so for instance, this novel use of um, consultation for maybe, uh, you know, uh, driving the panic down a little bit. It was higher in the first wave than it was in follow-up waves. Um, or this uh, use of teleconsultation to issue certificates that were necessary according to the measures that were taken during lockdown and lifted again. So these are all things that we need to that we need to reconsider. But of course, the question is in the in the chat as well. Does that also signal a preference on behalf of the patients that they would prefer a face-to-face -face consultation over a teleconsultation and perhaps a Zoom consultation over a phone consultation? So this is something that we definitely, as, as Dominic also pointed out at the end, we need more uh, work and clearer studies that are desi designed for this um, to look at that. One interesting area to pass uh, the first uh, baton back to our panelists, and there is a couple of more uh, of other ones that I will get back to later, um, is this question of remote monitoring. So we are talking about remote consultations, but we know uh, that you can use um, the digital uh, technology that we use for that sort of thing, also database to monitor patients um, by measuring uh, uh, oxygen uh, levels, for instance, um, remotely. And the question to the panelists is to the extent that they are aware of this, um, how that, and if that changed during the pandemic. Shall we start with Dalila in the same order as we, as we talked? 
Yes. Um, so regarding the um, well, the the remote um, monitoring. Well, in France, we did not. Um, well, we we used it, but I mean, for and I think that's what you mentioned for oxygen oxygen therapy um yeah we developed remote consultations but it was more for related to well in private pra uh, practices uh, for 96 percent of the cases so we do not really have um yeah remote um well yeah remote um uh, well, monitoring yeah for 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 those kind of things yeah Okay, what is the situation in, in Belgium? Did you use some remote monitoring? In Belgium, some uh, projects have now started up during the second wave with uh, telemonitoring and uh, teleconsultation. Focusing on what? On uh, For patients with COVID at home. Okay, so for a look. And uh, Dominic uh, in Germany? I think um, we will have to look at the fact that a lot of the elderly uh, uh, much more reluctant to actually attend practices in person. And I think that will require new answers, um, especially for the chronically ill. We've seen uh, 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 an enormous um, uh, reduction of patients uh, accepting disease management programs right now that are actually quite um, broad and, and, and uh, have been working very well prior to the pandemic. Um, so that's why we are pushing towards digitally supported remote patient monitoring. But um, my impression is that um, uh, from the physician side, it's not always seen very efficient, uh, partly because it takes as much time as seeing a patient, probably more, and you can do less. And uh, so that needs to be balanced somehow. Um, there might be a role for it actually um, for remote um, uh, consultations in out of our services. And we're pushing uh, in Germany to uh, provide a, a first assessment system for all people who would like to call uh, a specific number. That's not the 112, not the emergency, but uh, another number, 116, uh, 117. Uh, and, and, and these are the very often milder cases of, of, of uh, patients or patients that need to be talked to first be, be, before it can be uh, uh, decided whether this patient actually needs to see a physician and there might be a specific role in the future. Thank you so much, Dominic. Erika, from your research across uh, different countries, any, any conclusions to be drawn with regards to remote uh, monitoring? Um, well, I'm going to take the opportunity to do a quick plug and recommend that people tune in next week where we're actually going to be looking at the rollout of digital yeah. technologies more broadly although we're linking it to the um, test and trace apps um, but using that as a lens to look at the rollout of uh, digital technologies more broadly um, there isn't a lot of uh, discussion of rolling out remote monitoring well there's a lot of discussion of it but i'm not aware of any countries really ramping it up during the pandemic um, which if you think about the logistics is perhaps unsurprising because you need to have the technology in place and train the patients and train the um, health workers in order for it to be uh, provide you know remotely providing good quality care and good quality remote monitoring um, I noticed in the chat box that people have been talking about the Australian experience and that's something probably to look at because they, they are um, very, very experienced in dealing with remote consultations, particularly for um, underserved areas, remote, rural, very remote in Australia, <laughs> remote, rural populations. So, yeah, uh, just just, you know, I know it's not in Europe, but uh, they are in Eurovision. So I think it's I think it's OK to big them up. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, Dimi, back to you in the chat box. Exactly. So I, uh, Erica already mentioned the Australian example. There's also an example from the US, very interesting um, in the chat box. And I think it, it shows there are established practices that were not de developed in a panic, as was the case in many situations with the pandemic. So that's something to look at. Um, one thing that has been coming up, and I think it came also uh, up in Erica's presentation and in the spotlight presentation, is the issue of reimbursement. 
So if we look at reluctance in the health system um, to uh, drive forward remote consultations, is reimbursement the tool to use um, to actually bring that forward? How do we adapt it? Um, and we have a couple of examples also from France, for, for instance, that this was perhaps changed for physicians, but not changed for dentists. Uh, so that again, um, slowed digital uh, consultations in that, um, in that area of care. So perhaps the question that uh, boils down from all the different bits and pieces uh, on reimbursement in the chat is, how do we deal with that? What, do we, what have we seen? And do we keep that as a, as a, a preparedness measure or do we keep that uh, for uh, long-term, even after the pandemic is at some point behind us? Thank you, Dimi. Can we go in the same order? Dalia, you start with regards to the reimbursement question, retaining it and what are the elements of it actually? And how does it link to the general payment system of doctors and nurse doctors? Yeah. Uh, so in France, we um, yeah we reimbursed um, actually yeah. So this is what's told um, for consultations with physicians. But yeah, actually as it was said um, in the chat, yeah, we did not reimburse for um, dentists, but we also reimburse for so many uh, health professionals such as uh, physiotherapists or um, well yeah even nurses. Um, yeah, I think it's um, it's something that we are um, it's still you know in negotiations about like the payment, the reimbursement. Um, basically, I know that um, in the negotiations with the, with the dentists, for example, um, they, they want to, for example, be reimbursed for telephone consultations and um, CNAM and the Ministry of Health in France has been quite reluctant about it. Uh, but yeah, the, about the payment and, and, and the reimbursement, it's, it's still on, on the table and uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Dalia. Patrick. Um, I think that in the national health insurance system in Belgium is quite in favor of uh, promoting uh, all type of telehealth and they want to invest a lot of more money into the system. But of course, still not of, a lot of research still needs to be done on what type of e-health and telehealth you need, what type of professional groups, uh, what type of patients. So uh, a lot of research still needs to be done, but they are really uh, uh, believing in it. How, how, is it how, how is it done in practice? Is it a, a, an item on the fee schedule which you can use or? Yeah. Yes, right at the moment, the, there is a fee schedule for each uh, remote consultation. And uh, we have seen that, that the number of uh, teleconsultations exploded right from the moment that reimbursement was arranged. So I think practice follows the money as well. Huh? And uh, we just heard that sometimes tele um, remote consultation are not always favored by doctors because they're also quite intense. Is it, is it equivalent, you know, the, the reimbursement to face-to-face -to -face, um, consultation or is it lower or higher or otherwise differentiated? I don't know by heart now, but I thought it was a, a bit less than face-to-face uh, -face consultations. But... Okay, thank you so much, Patrick. Dominic? Uh, Germany has a resource-based relative value scale, um, so uh, payment is somehow related to the uh, time that goes into physician time that goes into a specific service um, on sort of average on uh, a, an empirical basis and uh, the resources that are needed, uh, team, uh, technical devices and so on, uh, investment costs, um, rooms plus uh, and um, um, so in that sense, obviously, a telephone consultation draws less money uh, because it's uh, it, it just based on the time factor of, of the uh, consultation. Um, and uh, I would say that it actually reduces the uh, uh, um, efficiency of a practice at this point um, because um, you use the same amount of time but you can't provide the same kind of service and German f practices are used to handling a large number of patients which is not possible right now because of in infection um, regulations and uh, um, so the payers have been very reluctant to follow that uh, lead. Um, they've also been reluctant to follow uh, support to support telehealth uh, for similar reasons. And I think what we're going to see is uh, with an expansion of um, teleconsultations, um, 
um, is a, a risk diversification of patients. So some patients who really need some DTC physicians will flock into certain practices uh, who then have a different uh, set of risks they deal with. And, and then that will change the, the amount of money they need. And I'm not sure how we will pull that apart in the future. So that, that, that will be a challenge. Very interesting. Thank you so much. First of all, more limited service via telecommunication, te tele um, uh, remote consultation, but also the 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 threat or the the danger that um, the the patients go to different um, practices and there will be an imbalance. So very interesting. Thank you so much, Erica. From your point of view, I mean, you've researched this across the the board. Uh, anything you would like to add to this one? I think just following up from what Dominic was saying is that we need to uh, look, it's not just about the financial incenti incentives. Obviously the financial incentives have to be right and they have to be um, tailored and they have to be very specific and you have to be very clever with them to make sure that you're putting the correct incentives in place. But it's not just about the money, it's also about the time. So if it, is it more efficient time-wise to see that patient face-to-face -face, or is it more efficient to just pick up the phone and chat to them and if it's more efficient to pick up the phone and chat to them or to do a quick video call um, then doctors will use it but if it's more efficient to see them face-to-face -face, why would they go for a remote consultation so uh, so this is these are the sorts of things we also also need to factor in it's not just about the money it's also about the time thank you so much erica and i think Demi, we still have time for one very quick round of questions. And Dominic, yes, Dominic, please come in. Well, just one brief issue on that, Erica. I think um, we have different issues of time. Physician time, which is for reimbursement and incentives uh, and, and, and the willingness to provide the service, but it's also patient time. And I think the efficiency of practices right now very often depends on the fact that they take a lot of patient time because the patient is sitting there waiting to see the physician. And when the physician is ready, the patient comes in to a three minute consultation that is very efficient for the physician, but it may not be efficient for the patient. And so I think we, we see a societal um, uh, um, a battle here really, um, whose time is more valuable. Exactly. And like you were saying about video consultations being more popular with patients and less popular with doctors yeah. because they take time. Yeah. Demi, last round of uh, questions, please. Exactly, and I'm, I'm very grateful uh, to Dominic because that was the point uh, I was going to make. Also reading a little bit out of the chat because we talked about efficiency in the last round, but another issue that keeps coming up is the issue of equity. Um, and who is joining the remote consultation and who is neglected? Um, and how do we make sure that we roll it out in a way that reaches those most in need and most vulnerable first? Um, so I think... One point that I will make, and I won't, I won't take a lot of time because we only have four minutes and we want to go back to the panelists, is that there is a lot of input in the chat from different participants who are sending us, and sending us links from their countries. And it's really interesting. So my suggestion is at the end we stay, we, we leave the, the webinar open a little bit so that everyone can scroll through. Um, because this is very, very cool. Um, so there is a lot of things that I didn't know and I'm really looking forward to reading. Uh, but summing up, um, the issue of equity, uh, and if we want to move forward with this, how do we make sure that we don't disadvantage some uh, of our uh, patients and of our people more than others? Back to you. Yeah, so um, for the, the case in France, uh, basically what, what we did with the, uh, in, well, we implemented the telephone consultation exceptionally uh, just for the pandemic, is that we wanted to make sure that these people that do not have access to internet or who are yeah, really struggling with all these technologies and yeah um, have access to, to health. But the thing is, um, we also, well, thanks to teleconsultations, we expect, you know, um, to, well, not to to tackle medical deserts, obviously, but um, when we, we did our statistics regarding the pandemic and how it was used for, um, well, in France in general, it, 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 it shows that one fifth of the populations um, in France uh, using uh, teleconsultations was from Paris and its uh, outskirts, which means that basically um, well, it shows uh, teleconsultations um, were 
well, yeah, carried out more um, from rich people. So yeah, I think this is what we are studying at SCNAM um, to see if it reaches um, yeah, um, vulnerable people and uh, yeah. Thanks, Dalia. Patrick? I'm not aware of uh, Belgian data regarding equal access for all citizens uh, right now and to what extent lower uh, socioeconomic groups also have used video consultation or telephone consultation compared to other groups. Okay, thanks, Dominic. Well, we need to look into that. We haven't done it yet, but we see that we have certain areas in Germany that are going to be underserved in the future, uh, economically weak rural areas, and it will be an issue there. Excellent. So I think uh, I would first of all like to thank all the spotlight speakers and uh, helping us to understand in a very concrete way the situation in the countries. And I would like now um, Erica and Dimi that you guys uh, wrap up. Erica, uh, you've done all the research and the overview and you heard all the input from the colleagues. And Dimi, you've seen the, the chat box. Maybe you want to also add um, one, one sentence to, the, to Erica's wrap up. Is it okay, Erica? Please go ahead. Yeah. Really, the, uh, there was a point that was made in the chat box that um, I thought was a really, really excellent one. And I think it probably only came to all the panelists. So I wanted to sort of bounce it back to all the attendees as well. Um, and it was uh, from something that uh, someone has said at the Gastein conference, which is that when it comes to equity, if you reach out to the marginalized groups, if you target the most marginalized groups and ensure access for them, you've pretty much made sure that the overall population is already reached by your services. So that's what we should probably be looking at, not rolling out remote consultations in general, but rolling out remote consultations to the most marginalized groups. And that way we ensure we cover everybody. Great, thank you. Dimi. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Matthias. Thank you, everybody. I think uh, I, I will just repeat what I, I, I mentioned earlier. There is a this is clearly a very dynamic area, so we are learning by, by doing because this is a phenomenon that emerged uh, with a, well, it didn't emerge with the pandemic, but we have a new look on it uh, compared to how we were looking at it before. And there is a lot of uh, country practices that we can learn from um, in the chat uh, from countries that have had it for a long time, like Australia, and we see best practices there, even with those who cannot actually reach technology themselves very easily. Um, I think we will be discussing this for, for a long time. Uh, this is a good thing. And there is a lot of food for thought to build on uh, where we are now already. Dimi, thank you so much. And thank you so much to everyone and to all the um, colleagues who have actually used the chat box. We have quite a number of input today and probably will take us some time to, to read through it. And um, I can only thank you so much. And um, uh, please tune in next week, lunchtime, when we will talk about Corona apps. And as Erica said, it's not just about the apps. It's actually about digital technologies uh, in, in use in, in more general terms. So hope to see you back next week. And bye-bye. Take care.